Hello, everyone, and welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are tuning in from today. And welcome to today's online learning session on humanitarian law and policy. My name is Anherid Lang. For those of you who don't know me yet, I'm the executive director of PHAP. That's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. I'll be serving as your co-host today, together with my colleague, Theo Boutrouche. Hello, everyone. My name is Theo, and I'm the Humanitarian Law and Policy Calls Director at PIAP. In today's session, we will be analyzing the recent attack in DRC, killing 15 peacekeepers and injuring more than 50, which has renewed a legal debate over the status of UN peacekeepers under IHL. Let's now focus on the substance of today's event. As mentioned, we will analyze the attack on UN peacekeepers that took place in December 2017 off Kivu, which the UN Secretary General has called a war crime. Our legal experts today will explore the legal challenges related to UN peacekeepers operating in situations of ongoing armed conflict, explaining when UN peacekeepers are subject to international humanitarian law and which rules of IHL are relevant for peacekeepers and how this set of norms applies to the recent cases in DRC. Now, I'd like to briefly introduce our first speaker today's event. Martin Zwazenberg is a strategic advisor with the International Law Division of the Dutch Ministry for Foreign Affairs, where he advises on various issues such as international law concerning the use of force, IHL, and peace operations. He also teaches a course on UN peacekeeping in the Master of Advanced Studies in International Public Law Program at Leiden University. I will now give the floor to Martin uh, for his uh, presentation. Thank you very much, um, Theo, for that introduction. Um, it's very exciting to take part in this webinar with so many practitioners that I see are, are taking place. Um, before I start, I should mention that um, although I work for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, today I'm not speaking on, on their behalf. I'm only here in my uh, personal capacity. Um, so by way of introduction to today's topic, what I would like to do is talk a little bit about first whether and if so UN peacekeepers may be subject to international humanitarian law or IHL. Second, when um, peacekeep UN peacekeepers are subject to IHL, which of course um, gives away the answer to the first question. Thirdly, which IHL rules are relevant for UN peacekeepers? And finally, um, I will go into a little bit more detail on how all this relates to the attack on MONUSCO on 7 December 2017. So to start with the question whether UN peacekeepers may be subject to IHL. Now from a historical perspective, the early view after the UN was established was that there was some doubt whether IHL was applicable to UN peacekeepers. One um, argument brought forward for this was that the UN would be unable to apply a number of provisions of IHL relating among other things to territory, legislation, and the possibility of criminal prosecution for war crimes. And also there was a view that um, there could be no equality be between UN peacekeepers representing the international community on the one hand and the opposing party on the other hand. But as time went by, it was gradually accepted by states and by the UN itself that IHL can be applicable to UN peacekeepers. And this, this was reflected in a, in a number of documents and statements, including, for example, the Status of Forces Agreements conclu concluded between the UN and host states of peacekeeping operations, starting with the Status of Forces Agreement for the operation in Rwanda in 1992. It was also reflected in the 1999 Secretary General's Bulletin on the application, on the observance of IHL by UN forces, which is a document that plays a very important role in discussing the application of IHL to peacekeeping. Also in statements by the UN itself, uh, including in a statement by the UN Legal Council in 2013 relating to MONUSCO. And finally, this is also a view that is reflected in mandating resolutions, uh, notably in resolution 2348 of last year, in which the Security Council stresses the need to carry out operations in strict compliance with international law, including international humanitarian law and international human rights law as applicable. So this was a resolution that related specifically to MONUSCO, which is the operation that we're 
discussing today. So the question is, if IHL can be applicable to peacekeepers, when is, is it applicable? When are UN peacekeepers subject to IHL? Well, the starting point to answer that question is that IHL only applies to parties to an armed conflict. And that means that for UN peacekeepers to be bound by IHL, in principle, there has to be first an armed conflict, and second, a peacekeeping operation has become a party to that conflict. So those would be the two requirements in principle for the application of IHL. If there is an armed conflict, but the peacekeeping operation is not a party to that conflict, so the mere presence of peacekeepers without them becoming a party to a conflict uh, means that IHL may not bind those peacekeepers, but they can still be protected by humanitarian law. As I said before, the mere presence of peacekeepers in an area where there is an armed conflict doesn't mean that they are bound by IHL, but it does mean that they are protected by it. When one very important protection is the protection from direct attack. Unless peacekeepers become a party to a conflict, they are civilians, or at any rate, they should be seen as equivalent to civilians, and as such, they may, not be, they may not be attacked under humanitarian law. The question is then, <clears throat> when do UN peacekeepers lose that protection from direct attack? Now, there are two possible approaches. One approach would be to apply the humanitarian law rule on direct participation in hostilities. This means that civilians, and in this case that would include UN peacekeepers, lose their protection from direct attack if and for such time as they directly participate in hostilities. Once they stop doing so, they regain protection from direct attack. This approach has been followed by a number of international tribunals that have dealt with attacks on UN peacekeepers, including the ICTY, the ICTR, and the Special Court for Sierra Leone. And this also seems to be the approach that is taken in the UN Secretary General's bulletin that I mentioned before, which in the article that relates to the application of IHL refers to, to the extent and for the duration of their engagement. So that means the engagement of UN peacekeepers in an armed conflict. A second different approach would be to look at a peacekeeping operation as equivalent to armed forces of a party. In that case, peacekeepers would lose protection from direct attack when the party they belong to becomes party to an armed conflict. And that would remain the case throughout the duration of the armed conflict. So no regaining protection from direct attack once peacekeepers no longer directly participate. The criteria for answering the question when, whether, UN, whether a UN peacekeeping operation becomes a party to a non-conflict should be answered on the basis of IHL criteria. And we're all, we, of course, all know the Tadic formula, which was the formula set out by the ICTY for determining whether or not there is a non-conflict. And the ICTY said that there is an international armed conflict when a conflict is, whenever there is a resort to armed force between states. And the ICTY said that there is a non-international armed conflict whenever there is protracted armed violence between governmental authorities and organized armed groups or between such groups within a state. Now, applying those criteria to UN peacekeeping operations, one could say that the term state and governmental authorities, respectively, in that Tadic criteria should be read as including a UN peacekeeping operation. So in other words, the UN in that case would be analogized to a state. And, and if you follow that, um, if you follow that reasoning, then if we look at what type of conflict UN peacekeepers could be party to uh, in case they were fighting a state. Uh, this would mean that the UN peacekeeping operation would become a party to an international armed conflict um, because uh, a state would be fighting um, another entity, in this case the UN, that is analogized to a state. But the question is if a UN peacekeeping operation is fighting a non-state uh, armed group, whether that armed conflict is an international armed conflict or a non-international armed conflict. There is some controversy, but my view would be that the better view is that in that case, there is a non-international armed conflict to which the UN is a party. Um, therefore, my conclusion that the UN can be a party to either an international armed conflict or a non-international armed conflict. As I said, the criteria for being a party to an armed conflict are those set out 
in IHL, and uh, what we can do is apply the criteria set out by the IC2I in uh, its decision on uh, the defense motion for interlocutory appeal on jurisdiction in the Tadic case. There is also a theory which has been put forward by the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is that a peacekeeping operation that in a non-international armed conflict supports one of the parties in a pre-existing non-international armed conflict can become a party to that conflict without itself fulfilling the intensity criterion, which is one of the two criteria that has been developed by the ICTY for determining whether there is a non-international armed conflict. This is the so-called support-based approach. The IC ICRC has put forward four conditions for this approach to be applicable. The first would be that there is a pre-existing non-international armed conflict ongoing in the territory where multinational forces are intervening. The second condition is that the actions related to the conduct of hostilities are undertaken by the multinational force in the context of that pre-existing conflict. The third condition is that the multinational forces military operations are carried out in support of the party to that pre-existing conflict. And the fourth and final condition is that the action in question is undertaken pursuant to an official decision by the troop contributing state or the international organization in question to support a party involved in that pre-existing conflict. Now I should point out that this support-based approach has, is somewhat controversial and that it is unsettled whether this is the lex lata or the international law that applies, that is in force. So just setting out those four conditions in the PowerPoint presentation for you. This brings us to the question, which IHO rules are relevant for UN peacekeepers? Now, the answer I would say in principle is that the same rules apply to UN peacekeepers as for other parties. In other words, all IHL rules are in principle relevant for UN peacekeepers, um, but um, since the UN is not a party to IHL treaties, what is particularly important is which rules form customary rules of international humanitarian law, because it will be those rules that will be applicable to a UN peacekeeping operation. Having said that, some rules cannot be implemented by the UN itself, at least not easily. Think, for example, of IHL rules that relate to exercising jurisdiction or IH rules that refer to a state's territory. Since the UN doesn't have any territory of itself, nor does it have a criminal jurisdiction system of itself, at least not one that relates to UN peacekeepers directly, and the UN itself cannot directly apply those IHL rules, and it will need to make use of capabilities of troop contributing states. And although it is the fact that as I said, I think that all IHL rules are in principle relevant for UN peacekeepers. If we look to practical operations by peacekeepers on the ground, I think that a number of particularly relevant rules, but perhaps and probably not the only ones, relate to the protection of civilian population. And of course, protection of civilians is one of the main issues that are on the agenda of the Security Council in relation to peacekeeping operations at the moment. Also particular, particularly relevant are rules on detention. And uh, thirdly, also I would say of particular relevance are, is the obligation to ensure respect for the rules of IHL. Now, there is some debate on what this obligation that is set forth in Common Article 1 to the Geneva Conventions means in practice, but I would say that it is a particular relevance when a UN peacekeeping operation collaborates with the forces of the host state or other local forces, uh, and uh, it, this suggests that there is a role for the UN peacekeeping operation not only for itself to respect the rules of IHL, but also that there is an obligation to ensure respect by local forces for IHL. And we can discuss, of course, what, how far-reaching this obligation is and what it would mean in practice. This brings me to uh, the particular attack that we're talking about today, which is the attack on MONUSCO in the Democratic Republic of Congo on 7 December 2017. Now, just a few quick facts on this particular attack. This attack involved elements of uh, an insurgent group called the ADF 
on the MONUSCO operating base. The ADF elements were wearing Congolese, uni Congolese Army uniforms, and their attack resulted in protracted fighting between the ADF on the one hand and MONUS MONUSCO and forces of the uh, DRC Army on the other hand. Um, in this fighting, the ADF used, among other things, mortars and rocket-propelled grenades. The fighting led to the deaths of 15 Tanzanian peacekeepers and 53 were wounded. And this led the UN Secretary General to state that these attacks are unacceptable and they constitute a war crime. Now, the question is, was that attack indeed a war crime? And for the answer to that question, we first need to discuss whether MONUSCO was a party to an armed conflict with the ADF. To answer that question, we first have to look at the two criteria for determining whether there is a non-international armed conflict. Now again, if we go to the case law of the ICTY in particular, the ICTY has developed two criteria to determine whether or not there is a non-international armed conflict. The first criterion is that the groups that take part in the fighting have a minimum level of organization. And the second criterion is that there is a minimum intensity of the fighting that is taking place. Apply these criteria to this particular incident, the first question is whether the level of organization of the ADF was sufficient to meet the first criteria. Now, with limited information about the particular facts and the particular makeup of this group, um, I find it difficult to answer this question, but we could discuss this further during the question and answer session. The second criterion relates to the level of intensity of the fighting, as we discussed before. And in this case, uh, and in this context, I think it's relevant to take into account that there were previous attacks on MONUSCO that were reported to be carried out by the ADF. One took place on 18th September of 2017, uh, which was an attack in which one peacekeeper was killed and one was wounded when MONUSCO supported um, the, the, the DRC army against presumed elements of the ADF. And a second incident took place on 9th of October of 2017, when an attack presumed to be by the ADF took place on a MONUSCO position, leading to three peacekeepers killed and several wounded. Also relevant is that the statement by the special investigation that the UN ordered to be carried out after the incident in December um, uh, included a statement and a conclusion that the three attacks, so the one in September, the one in October, and then the one in December against the UN peacekeepers, were carrying, carried out using a similar modus operandi and that all available evidence points to the ADF as the attacker. So this statement, this conclusion would justify taking at least these three incidents together to determine whether the intensity of the fighting qualified for a non-international armed conflict. And I think it's reasonably arguable that indeed this would amount to protracted armed violence in the sense of the ICTY case law and this, this particular criterion having been met. If we then, from that starting point, discuss whether the attack in December on MONUSCO was a war crime, um, if we determine that MONUSCO was not a party to the armed conflict, um, for example, because uh, the uh, organization, the criterion requiring, requiring a minimum level of organization of the ADF was not met, then we can, can conclude that the attack on the peacekeepers was an attack on civilians, or at least persons with equivalent protection as civilians, uh, which would be a war crime, because attacking civilians is a war crime in both international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict. If, on the other hand, we would con conclude that MONESCO was a party to an armed conflict with the ADF, the attack as such would not be a war crime. This is because military personnel of MONESCO in that case did not enjoy protection from direct attack, but that does not take away that the attack could still be a violation of domestic law. This is because there is no combatant's privilege in non-international armed conflict, which means that a state can still criminalize attacks on combatants without this being a war crime under humanitarian law. If the attack in itself was not a war crime, there is still a question whether the way it was carried out perhaps made it a war crime. In particular, the element um, which I referred to before 
that the ADF were wearing Congolese army uniforms at the moment that they attacked the MONUSCO operating base. Now, making improper use of the uniforms of the adversary is prohibited in an international armed conflict. Under the statute of the International Criminal Court, it is a war crime in an international armed conflict when it results in death or serious personal injury. However, making improper use of the uniforms of the adversary does not seem to be prohibited in non-international armed conflict. At least, it is not included as such in the statute of the International Criminal Court. So this concludes my presentation and introduction to the topic. I would like to thank you for atten your attention. And I look forward to the presentation by Kichiro and to the question and answer session. Thanks a lot, Martin, for this uh, great presentation. Um, I will now, uh, before we move to the, the Q&A um, part of this webinar, we'd like to give the floor to the, to the second speaker, Kishiro Okimoto, who kindly agreed to, uh, to contribute to that webinar. He's currently a legal officer at the UN Secretariat, and he has been advising on IHL matters, including IHL issues pertaining to uh, MONUSCO and other peacekeeping operations since uh, 2012. Prior to joining the UN, he was a delegate and legal advisor at the ICRC in Iraq, Israel and Palestine, Philippines and Rwanda. Uh, we now give the floor to Keshiro, and then we can uh, come back to um, the, the various questions you, you may have. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Joe, for your introduction. Um, just like Martin, I would like to just mention that I am speaking in my personal capacity, although I work for the UN Office of Legal Affairs. Um, thanks again for giving me this opportunity to um, make this short intervention. As, as I've been given five minutes for my intervention, I'll try to be you know, brief. Uh, with my intervention. Um, I would like to add a couple of points to what uh, Martin has said and would like to provide a bit more context to the topic of today's um, seminar. So first, um, I would like to point out that the compliance with IHL by UN peacekeeping operation has you know, recently become a very topical subject again. But in fact, the question of compliance has little or no relevance to many of um, the peacekeeping operations deployed today. So, for example, when you look at places like um, Haiti, Liberia, Cyprus, and Western Sahara, there is no active armed conflict taking place. So, the peacekeeping operations deployed there, you know, do not engage in armed clashes with armed groups. So, really, the question of compliance with IHL has little or no relevance to those UN peacekeeping operations. The, the question of compliance with IHL really becomes most relevant to peacekeeping operations in very specific circumstances in particular when peacekeeping operations are deployed to active armed conflict situations, such as you know, the De Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mali, the Central African Republic, and, and South Sudan. But the fact that a peacekeeping operation has been deployed to an armed conflict situation does not mean that the peacekeeping operation has become engaged in an armed conflict. A peacekeeping operation would have to be engaged in armed clashes with an organized armed group on a regular basis to be considered as being engaged in a non-international armed conflict. The second point I wanted to make was that when discussing whether a peacekeeping operation could become a party to an armed conflict, many commentators have focused on MONUSCO, the UN mission in DRC. However, there are in fact several other peacekeeping operations that are deployed to armed conflict situations and that are authorized to use force to carry out their mandates, such as those in Mali and the Central African Republic. So these missions could also become involved in armed clashes with armed groups. What is different from MONUSCO is that these peacekeeping operations are authorized to use force, for example, to protect civilians or to protect UN personnel. But they're not specifically authorized to carry out offensive operations to neutralize armed groups like MONUSCO. So the use of force by such peacekeeping operations tends to be a defensive rather than offensive. So um, they are often attacked by armed groups and might, from time to time, react to such attacks by the use of force. But such use of force in reaction to attacks would not instantly make peacekeeping operation a party to an, to an armed conflict. But if such a peacekeeping mission uses force in reaction to attacks on a regular basis, a question could arise as to whether the mission has become a party to a non-international armed conflict. I would recall in this regard that under IHL, a non-international armed conflict exists when there is protracted armed violence with an organized armed group. Whether the armed violence has become protracted is often difficult to establish, and you know this is particularly the case with peacekeeping operations, which use force mostly in a defensive manner rather than 
in an offensive manner. So when peacekeeping missions use force mostly for defensive purposes, it might be more difficult to establish whether they are engaged in armed conflict, as it is often unclear whether the level of violence between the mission and the armed group has reached the threshold required by IHL. The third point I wanted to make was about the uh, support-based approach. So Mr. Swanenberg has already described the essence of this approach, um, but perhaps there are you know, still a couple of issues that require further reflection with respect to the support-based approach. Uh, one of the issues is that you know, a peacekeeping mission could be considered as a party to an armed conflict uh, without direct armed clashes with an armed group, according to this approach. Um, so, um, according to the support-based approach, certain military support given to a government force could make a peacekeeping mission a party to an armed conflict without the mission becoming directly involved in armed clashes with an armed group. I again recall that under IHL, a non-international armed conflict exists when there is protracted armed violence with an organized armed group. Um, so IHL normally requires armed clashes directly with an armed group. So whether the support-based approach is consistent with the existing IHL is a question that requires further reflection and discussion. The fourth point I wanted to make was that uh, in recent years, the focus of you know, the discussion has really been on when peacekeeping personnel could lose the protection from being attacked and when they could be targeted. But there is less discussion on what happens when peacekeeping personnel have lost the protection from being attacked. Uh, in this regard, I would mention that even when peacekeeping personnel have lost such protection, there is still other protection that applies to them. Uh, so when peacekeeping personnel are wounded or detained in the course of a military operation with armed groups, they are protected by IHL. So Article 3, Common to the Geneva Conventions, uh, requires the parties to armed conflict to treat wounded and detained persons humanely. The uh, International Tribunal for the Foreign Yugoslavia, ICTY, confirmed this point quite clearly in the Karadzic case. So the tribunal said that, and I quote, even if the UN personnel had been combatants prior to their detention, they were entitled to the minimum protections guaranteed by a common article 3. Finally, I would like to mention a few words on the criminal aspect of attacks against peacekeeping personnel. So it is now expected that intentional attacks against peacekeeping personnel in the course of an armed conflict is a war crime, as long as they are entitled to the protection given to civilians under IHL. And in practice, the Special Court for Sierra Leone convicted Isra Hassan Tissay, a senior officer in an, in an armed group in Sierra Leone, to 51 years imprisonment for committing and ordering attacks against military personnel uh, of the UN peacekeeping operation in Sierra Leone, Leone in 2000. But whether a person should be convicted for attacking peacekeeping personnel, including those personnel who are actively engaged in fighting, is really a matter for the courts to address. It is the court's job for you to examine the facts, apply the law, and convict the accused, or not convict the accused, depending on the conclusion of the court. As courts are independent, the UN would refrain from interfering in criminal proceedings and courts. But I would mention that the government that is hosting the peacekeeping operation has an obligation to investigate incidents involving attacks against peacekeeping personnel, as required by the relevant status of forces agreement included between the UN and the host state government. So host states are required to investigate cases in which peacekeeping personnel are attacked and submit them to the competent authorities for the purpose of prosecution. If the host state does not take any action, the UN is entitled to request the host state to take action, and the UN could also assist the host government in conducting investigations. But the rest of the criminal proceedings is we really a matter for the prosecutors and the courts, and the UN would have a limited role in, in those proceedings. And the UN also has no control over the type of crime the courts would invoke. Um, so a court might convict a person on the basis of its own penal code, it might convict a person for committing a war crime, or the court might even refer to the Convention on the Safety of Human and Associated Personnel of 1994, which criminalizes violent acts against uh, UN personnel. So these are some of the comments I wanted to make on the subject, and I hope it gave some bit more context to, to the subject. Um, may I stop here and give the floor back to uh, you. Thanks a lot, Tishiro, for, uh, for all those uh, additional comments. Um, very interesting. Um, before we get into the, the actual questions that were submitted by, by some of the participants, I would just like to uh, 
to check with Martin uh, and Kishiro if they have any comments with regard to the results of the of the polls. The first one was uh, about um, whether um, the UN peacekeepers were seen more as civilians or actors engaged in the armed conflict. And as you can see on the screen, uh, some 60, almost 70 percent uh, of those who took the poll um, answered that they would see UN peacekeepers as actors engaged in the armed conflict. I don't know if Martin or Kishiro, you have any comments with regard to that result? Well, you know, um, uh, it, it, the result surprises me a bit, at least, um, if, if actors engaged in the armed conflict would be seen as equivalent to party to an armed conflict. I think as Kichiro pointed out, in many, if not most, UN peacekeeping operations, I think uh, there's no question of the UN peacekeeping operation actually being a party to the conflict. Um, if it is, uh, this would be only in, in at most, uh, a, a few operations. Um, but uh, this, of course, all, all depends on uh, which particular situations of armed conflict the, uh, the persons who completed the poll were familiar with. And if that uh, was, in most cases, the situation in the DRC, for example, then, uh, then I would be much less surprised. Thank you. Um... And Kishiro, with regard to, to that poll or, or the other, uh, the other poll, which was more an open question with regard to the, to the implications of UN peacekeepers using force more often during an armed conflict, um, as you can see, there were various, um, answers when it comes to impartiality, to neutrality, to blurring the lines between humanitarian and, uh, military actors. I don't know if you had any comments, uh, on those, on those results. And if not, we could we could move to the Q and A session. Yes, uh, <clears throat> just to um, agree with Martin actually about the uh, this poll on whether peacekeeping personnel could be regarded as civilians or rather as an actor engaged in the armed conflict. Um, I think I also mentioned in my comments that you know it really depends on which peacekeeping personnel uh, peacekeeping operation you're you're talking about. Uh, many of them are not really deployed to armed conflict situations, so it's quite clear in those cases that they are, you know, um, well, the IHL in, in the first place is not really relevant. But even where, you know, um, peacekeeping operations are deployed to armed conflict situations, you have a situation like uh, Syria, uh, Golan, where UNDOP is deployed, and, you know, armed conflict is going on in Syria. I believe a couple of years ago there were some incidents that were that involved you know peacekeeping personnel being you know caught in between between fire um and in those cases i would say you know it's quite clear that um uh, they, they are entitled to the protection given to civilians under ihl um, but when you look at other situations like Moscow or you know mali uh there could be i mean the perception i can understand that the perception could be that you know those personnel who are um engaged in you know operations against armed groups could be regarded as, you know, having lost the protection from being attacked in the right show. Um, so, um, you know, I don't think, you know, we can really generalize. It really um, has to be contextualized and look at each and every peacekeeping operation um, in order to uh, see if they are entitled to the protection of given civilians or whether they can be considered as, you know, as um, those who are engaged directly in, in the armed conflict. Uh, thank you. Maybe just to, to follow up on, on those comments, um, there was a, a, a query for clarification, uh, and I think that was um, directed with regard to your, uh, your presentation, uh, Kishiro, uh, about whether you, you think that most peacekeeping operations are, are not um, engaged in an armed conflict, are not party to an armed conflict. Uh, and I think that was referring to uh, some of your uh, first comments when you were when you took the floor. Maybe have, have your views on that, uh, whether, whether you think in the, in the current context uh, you, would, you would say that most of peacekeeping operations are, are not considered parties to, a, to the armed conflict yeah. in which they are, they are deployed. Yeah, yeah. Well, in my comments I said actually many peacekeeping operations, not most. Um, I do um, understand that you know, many of the peacekeeping operations are actually in um, armed conflict situations, but there are actually many peacekeeping operations that are not. So um, I won't say most peacekeeping operations, I would say many of them are not. Uh, uh, I mean, the question of compliance with IHL you know, is not relevant to many peacekeeping operations.
situations. And I made that comment just to give the context, uh, um, because uh, the focus of discussion in recent years in the academia really has been on whether peacekeeping personnel have lost the protection from being attacked. And you know, there's not much discussion about how you know, they can be protected. So you know, just to give a bit of balance to the discussion, I thought I would make that comment that you know, the compliance with IHL and you know, a peacekeeping operation becoming part of an armed conflict um, is you know, not really relevant to uh, many of the peacekeeping operations that are deployed today. Thank you. Um, maybe now moving to uh, some specific questions we received during, uh, during your presentations. Um, there was, um, there was a, a question posed by, by David from the U.S. Um, uh, who specified that, uh, Kishiro, you already answered that question, but I, I'd like to, uh, to put it again uh, to both of you because I think it's an, it's an interesting one. Um, and uh, David asked if peacekeepers are attacked and defend their position from a party to the conflict, does this define the peacekeepers as directly involved in hostilities and no longer protected? Uh, by international humanitarian law. If uh, Martin, you, you you want to start, if you have any any thoughts on that. Um, well, well, I'd be happy to. That's it's a very good question, um, and of course it starts uh, as I discussed. I think there are two ways to look at whether IHL can come to bind a UN peacekeeping operation. One is to look at peacekeepers as directly participating in hostilities, and the other one is to look at them as the armed forces of a party to the conflict. So um, this question starts from the first premise, and I think the answer is that if peacekeepers defend our attack and they defend their position from attack, that doesn't necessarily make them directly participating in hostilities. Um, the notion of direct participation in hostilities is, of course, a very controversial one, and there's a lot of debate on what it means precisely, but I think everyone would agree that one element of it is that uh, the direct participation in hostilities is must be in support of one of the parties to the conflict, which means that if peacekeepers are attacked and they are not yet a party to the conflict, the fact that they defend themselves will not necessarily make them into direct participants in hostilities. Uh, and this is also the line of argumentation that, is, that has been followed by a number of the international criminal tribunals, um, including the, uh, the ICTY that uh, Kishiro referred to in his comments before. Thank you. Uh, Kishiro, I don't know if you have any, uh, any more uh, to, to add with regard to that, uh, that question by David. I think Martin uh, you know, answered that question quite adequately, so I have nothing to add on that point. Thank you. There was, uh, there was another one uh, by uh, Hans from Belgium. Um, that was not really a, a question, but more a comment, and I think it's, it's related to what we just discussed, uh, where Hans has, um, basically uh, asked whether uh, he, would, he would prefer to see UN peacekeepers as police officers, and a police officer using force to conduct his mission does not give a criminal the right to attack the policeman. So I don't know if uh, Martin or Kishiro, maybe Kishiro, if you, you have any additional comments with regard to that, uh, that perspective of, uh, of seeing UN peacekeepers as police officers? Yes, um, you know, that kind of uh, argument was made um, you know, long back in the 60s, 70s, probably the 80s too, or even later. Um, but uh, you know, the, the mindset was that you know, um, the UN is you know, acting on behalf of the international community. And when there are troubles in various countries, when there's an armed conflict, um, the UN peacekeeping operations, when they are deployed, they are deployed more in terms of, you know, uh, like policemen. Um, so that, you know, argument has been made in the past. Um, but I think um, since the 1990s and when we get into the 2000s, um, the uh, mindset has changed quite a lot in the sense that um, peacekeeping operations have, you know, become really engaged in armed clashes uh, quite often with um, armed groups. And, um, you know, the, you can really see the change of the mindset um, in the issuance of the Secretary General's bulletin on the observance by the UN forces uh, of this is an internal regulations within the United Nations um, that, you know, the peacekeeping operation operations have to uh, abide by. And it sets out various rules, uh, customary rules of IHL um, that they have to observe. So this, you know, it, in itself is sort of a reflection that, you know, um, 
you know, the UN, when they when peacekeeping operations are deployed, they're not just, you know, uh, there as uh, police, um, you know, as policemen, but they can also become engaged in um, an armed conflict directly. And there are cases where, you know, uh, both the peacekeeping operations and the armed groups will have to abide by the same rules. And, you know, when uh, peacekeeping operations use force, in some cases, uh, you know, personnel could lose their protection from being attacked. So that, you know, um, uh, sort of, the change in mindset has really happened in the late 1990s up to now. Um, so, but it's a quite recent trend. There was an argument in the past that you know UN should be treated as a policeman, and that you know um, any attacks against them should be should be should, should be a crime. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, Martin, if you have any any comments to add. Well, I, I, I'm afraid that I find myself in violent agreement with Kichiro. <laughs> 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 um, just to add, add one element, which is that um, I, I understand the argument, and as Kichiro said, this is an argument that was made uh, particularly in, in, the 60, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, I think when we talk about IHL, it's important to realize that um, one fundamental principle or underpinning or um, traditional element of IHL is the equality of the parties to an armed conflict. That is to say that the same rules apply to both parties. Um, and I think that if you would say that only one party um, can attack the other side, but the other party can't attack the one side under IHL, again, under municipal law, domestic law, as we discussed, this may be different, then that could lead to the undermining of IHL. Um, and it could also raise the question for the party opposing the UN, why it would still respect IHL if under IHL it could not attack the UN, but the UN could attack that party. And so I think that's the, that's an important element which has led to the position that I think is now more or less generally accepted that um, also UN forces can be bound by IHL and more importantly that they, at least under IHL, uh, can be attacked uh, if they are a party to an armed conflict. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, we, we are aware that we might not be able to uh, to take uh, all the questions and and provide uh, and the speakers to provide answers to all of them, but uh, I would just like to um, to pick one of the questions that was asked in advance of the webinar um, uh, by uh, John from South Sudan, um, and it has to do with um, how can the international community stop impunity for attacks against peacekeepers and enforce international law uh, when it comes to the protection of peacekeepers. So um, I'm aware this is uh, linked to a, a much broader debate, but um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to uh, make that link and, and see how we should have any thoughts on this issue of, of impunity for attacks against peacekeepers. Maybe. Uh, Shiro, if you have, or Martins, if you start by Martins this time, if you have uh, any thoughts on that. Well, it's, it's a very good question. Now, how for the international community to be able to stop impunity for attacks against peacekeepers, I would say that first the international community or the most relevant states have to have the legal system in place to undertake investigations and prosecutions and trials. Um, which means that um, whole states should create that possibility to prosecute attacks against peacekeepers. Uh, and one way they could do so would be to become a party to the Convention on the Safety of UN, uh, person, UN and, and Associated Personnel and implement that convention in their domestic law, uh, which certainly not all states have done. Um, another Interesting element is uh, that I would just like to point to is a suggestion that was recently made in the report by General Cruz on the security and safety of UN peacekeepers. Uh, and this report said that more attention should be paid to actually finding the perpetrators of attacks against peacekeepers after they, they have been carried out and bringing, to, bringing them to justice. Uh, and I think it would be interesting to look at whether there would be, whether that aspect could be further strengthened. Thank you very much. Kishiro, uh, just want to 
check with you if you have any other thoughts on, on this issue of impunity for attacks against peacekeepers. Yes, um, I think there are you know, a couple of legal instruments that actually address the, uh, the question. Um, probably the question now is more about the implementation of, of those uh, legal instruments. So from our perspective, there is you know, a status of forces agreement, uh, agreement with um, the host country. So this is this is an agreement that is completed between the UN and the host country, and it does provide for an obligation of the host state government to investigate when peacekeeping personnel are attacked and bring, submit those cases to the competent authorities for the purpose of prosecution. So um, there, there is that provision, there is that obligation of the host state government, um, but there is also that practical issue, um, which is that you know in many of these um, countries, the you know armed conflict is ongoing and you know the court, court structure might not be functioning at its you know at its maximum you know um, capacity so there is that uh, difficulty with um, you know trying uh, you know cases of uh, involving attacks against peacekeeping personnel in these you know countries although you know there is clear obligation of the whole state government to investigate and prosecute you know um, cases involving attacks against you know, peacekeeping personnel um, there is um, also the International Criminal Court, as has been referred to uh, uh, in Martin's uh, presentation. Um, there is a clear, uh, you know, um, provision that you know intentional attacks against peacekeeping personnel um, is a war crime. So there is, and ICC can also obviously um, deal with um, those cases. Um, and you know, there, there's no case at the moment uh, before the ICC that involves attacks against the UN peacekeeping personnel. But there is a case that involves attacks against um, eight, uh, African Union mission personnel. Um, so there, there is a case. Um, it can happen. Um, but obviously, the ICC does not deal with each and every you know case that involves attacks against peacekeeping personnel. So um, the host states, you know, will have to rely on host state too to um, you know really uh, address the issue of impunity. Thank you very much. Um, now uh, we'd like. To, uh, to finish this Q&A uh, session with an anonymous query for thought, uh, moving to another, um, another uh, debate or issue, um, the issue of whether the 7 December 2017 attack constitutes a war crime uh, is a legalistic question. I'm quoting this anonymous query. The larger issue is whether we have already eroded to an unacceptable extent the one sharp line between military and humanitarian operations, which are joint op uh, missions, civil military collaboration. So I would just like to put it to you, um, moving to another uh, issue than, than impunity, the question of blurring the, the line between the military and, and humanitarian uh, actors. I don't know if um, maybe this time, uh, Kishiro, if you want to uh, to make a few remarks on, on this issue, which is also an underlying uh, equation uh, with regard to UN peacekeeping operation? Yes, probably this is not, you know, strictly speaking, a legal question. It's more of an operational question. Uh, but uh, I am aware that, you know, there is that concern amongst the humanitarian community that, um, you know, uh, mandates such as, you know, those given to um, Monosco could actually affect, you know, the um, if you want humanitarian space of so humanitarian agencies, um, because many of those are actually UN um, humanitarian agencies, and um, there are many uh, NGOs that work with um, the UN in terms of uh, providing humanitarian assistance. So, um, if you know they are operating in the same area as uh, an operation like Monosco, there is definitely that. Um, you know, uh, risk that uh, they can also be seen as you know part of part of Moscow or part of the UN. Um, and if you know the UN operation is seen as you know being engaged in armed conflict directly, then you know that perception might also apply to you know the UN humanitarian agencies and other NGOs too. Um, so th there is that perception. I think it's more of a matter of um, how um, to really practically uh, address the question in the field, you know, and also to increase, you know, the uh, the security for those humanitarian personnel. Um, really, is, is is a practical question, um, and you know, I don't know if Martin has more to add on, on that point. Yeah, thanks, uh, Martin. Do do you uh, do you have any any thoughts on that that issue of blurring the lines between the military and humanitarian spheres? 
and well, actors? It's, it's certainly um, a, a valid question and a, and a valid um, concern. Um, and, and I would agree that it's perhaps not so much a legal question as one that goes to the implementation of missions um, and without in any way, shape, or form being an expert on, on this particular issue. Um, I suppose it works two ways. One, the more the clearer the distinction is between the military part of a UN operation on the one hand and humanitarian assistance on the other, uh, the less risk perhaps the humanitarian assistance will run when the UN is perceived to be a party to an armed conflict and thus seen to be as a legitimate target by the other party. On the other hand, I can imagine that there are situations where precisely some measure of military support is necessary in order to be able to um, give humanitarian assistance and to create the space for humanitarian assistance in the first place. And I think that the fact that one of the tasks in the mandate of many UN peacekeeping operations is precisely to support the delivery of humanitarian assistance is a reflection of that concern. So I, I think there are those two sides, and um, it is very much a question of how that is practically implemented, more perhaps than, than a strictly legal question. Thank you very much. Um, this concludes the, the Q&A uh, session. I'd just like to, uh, to mention that, uh, yes, of course, we uh, unfortunately we are not able to address all the, all the questions asked. Um, we would try uh, to follow up with the speakers for uh, the questions that were not answered. Um, but um, before we, we close that session, I would, I would like to um, give the floor to uh, Kishiro and then Martin for brief concluding remarks, um, if, uh, if you would like uh, to make some concluding remarks. Thank you. Yes, um, no, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to participate in this event and for you know, giving me this opportunity to make a short intervention and uh, you know, interact with the participants. And I also thank you know, the, uh, all the participants for their uh, interesting questions and comments. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Martin? Do you have any uh, concluding remarks? No, I would, I would certainly like to uh, thank all the participants for their participation and, and their questions. And, it's clear that this is a, that this is an issue that um, uh, many people have strong views about, uh, and I think it's it's a, it's a an issue that needs to be discussed and uh, needs to be discussed further. Um, so I certainly hope that uh, that this um, session will contribute to uh, bringing that discussion further and uh, and informing some uh, some further views. Thank you very much. I would just like to inform you that the audio and video recordings um, and uh, mentioned resources uh, for those presentations will be available in the next uh, few days on the event page and uh, all participants will be, uh, will be notified about this in a follow-up message. All right, so thanks to everyone and I'll jump in now with uh, just a few points regarding upcoming activities. Um, I'd really like to, though, uh, thank all of you for sticking with us. We had a lot of questions coming in, and so we went a bit beyond the hour, um, but a great discussion, and we look forward to the next ones. Um, so we'd like to share with you, first of all, the 2018 schedule for our face-to-face -face courses on humanitarian law and policy. We're not only engaging in these uh, great virtual discussions, but also taking these discussions all around uh, the world to a series of events um, throughout the year looking at different questions related to humanitarian law. Uh, each thematic workshop will focus on different issues of concern to humanitarian actors such as human rights in armed conflict and engagement with armed non-state actors. You can learn more about these upcoming face-to-face -face events by uh, following uh, the link, uh, clicking on the button there on the screen. We're also launching a new course uh, entitled Displacement, Forced Migration, and International Law. It consists of a core training course on refugees, IDPs, and forced migrants, protection and law in practice, as well as a series of complementary issue roundtables again, looking at the broader uh, questions and some specific uh, challenges related to displacement, forced migration, and international law. Uh, the, 
sessions will take place in Geneva, in Kampala, and Amman next year. Again, you can click the link there to view the full calendar and more information about these upcoming new events. Now back into the online sphere, we are happy to announce a new series of online events coming up in partnership again with ICFA, the International Council of Voluntary Agencies. Following the learning streams of uh, last year uh, on humanitarian financing and coordination, this new series will focus on the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus. The first session will take place in a couple of weeks on the 12th of April, introducing and providing an overview of the so-called Triple Nexus as a concept. You can already register by clicking on the banner you see in front of you. Uh, back to you, Teo, for your final comments. Thank you. Uh, we would like to, to thank uh, all the participants for their proactive involvement and very interesting questions. And uh, in particular, also thanks Martin and Keshiro for taking the time to share their insights on this issue. Um, we'd like also to invite the participant to fill in the survey after the event. And uh, thanks a lot very much again. Thanks, Theo. Uh, great co-hosting for the first time together. Look forward to many more in the future. And thanks Finally, uh, to everyone involved, here we are signing off from Geneva. Good uh, morning, good afternoon, good night. See you next time.